Acts 27, verses 13 through 32. And the Word of God says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a, with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. Verse number 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, and that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. <coughs> And sounded, and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing, lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, and wished for the day. And as the shipmen, these are the folks that are manning the ship, listen. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. Paul said to the centurion and, said, and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Verse number 32, <clears throat> Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to bring this truth. Lord, I thank you for the, the, the impact this truth has had on my life. Lord, I pray that you do the same thing uh, here today. Heavenly Father, I pray if there's one that's flailing, if there's one that's struggling, Lord, I pray this message would be just exactly what you have for them. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, there are many opportunities for distraction. Heavenly Father, my mind is prone to distraction, and uh, Lord, my thoughts are not always clear nor concise. And yet, Lord, we have the nursery, we have, we, have, we have different things that could draw our distractions. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help in a special way uh, to arrest our attention upon this truth today. Lord, I pray that you would help my thoughts to be clear and concise. And, and uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help, you'd help as I speak to ears, Lord, that you would speak to hearts. Heavenly Father, we, we would have what we need when we leave this place today. Lord, we sure do love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall. Now we've read the story. These men, of course, Paul, he's a prisoner here on his way to see Caesar. We find after reading this passage, there are 276 people on this vessel. When I think of a ship, I think of 30, maybe 40 men. 276 people on this vessel. The Bible says they come into a great storm, and for many days they don't even see the sun. They see that they're coming close to, to land, and uh, the Bible says that the shipmen, the men that are supposed to be steering the ship, the men that are supposed to be manning the sails, the men that are supposed to be working, they say, I'm getting out of this mess. I can hear land out there. Let's let down the lifeboat. Let's get out of here. The Bible says that they catch these shipmen, the guards, of, you know, the, the Roman guards are supposed to be watching these prisoners. They catch the operators of the ship trying to flee. And Paul says, look, you have all got to stay in the ship or none of us are going to be saved. God says he's going to deliver us all, but we've all got to stay in the ship. And so they do something that's very strange. God never commanded them to do. Paul certainly never suggested they do. 
Paul has come to them and said, the ship is not going to be saved, but every man will be. He said, this boat is not going to make it, but you are. And after hearing that, still these men try to escape. Now, probably in a fit of rage, probably in, a, in, a, in haste, these guards, they go over. And the Bible says rather than pulling that lifeboat back up to the side of the ship, what do they do? The Bible says they just take a sword and they cut it loose. And that lifeboat falls into the sea. When we read the rest of the passage, we find out that, um, many, that every one of these men made it to shore. But the Bible says in verse number uh, 44, if you want to look there with me, verse number 43, the Bible says, But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. So the sea is raging, so much so that this, this ship is torn into pieces. This ship is wedged. And the Bible says the waves are so fierce that it actually breaks this ship in two. And they're telling them, if you can swim, go ahead and hop in the sea. Now, I'm a very proficient swimmer, but I've been out on the water when it's sore tossed. <laughs> the last place I want to be is in the water when you have 20-foot swells. These men, they had to swim to shore. The Bible says, verse number 44, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of ship. And so it came to pass, they all escaped safe to land. What a miracle that all 276 of them survived. But we see how they had to survive. They had to swim in the tempest. They had to, some of them on broken pieces of ship, some of them on boards from the ship, have to doggy paddle their way to shore. Think about this. What a miracle it was that God spared each of their lives. But I have just one question for those guards. Why on earth did you cut the lifeboats? Now, if I was on that ship and the guards looked at me and said, you can swim. I just said, and you could have not cut the lifeboat. I can swim. There's sharks in that water. There's waves in that water. Why on earth did you cut those lifeboats? Nowhere were they commanded to. May I tell you today, it could have been so simple for them to make it safely to shore. They could have simply lowered the lifeboats and saved every man and all the supplies, by the way. All the supplies that they needed for their journey were gone. They could have saved all of that if they had just kept the lifeboats. But instead, we see these men were cast violently into the tumultuous sea and battered, barely making it on, barely making it to shore alive on broken pieces of wood. May I tell you this morning, I watch a lot of people do the very same thing in their Christian life. They get to the point, Miss Cindy, that they feel like they no longer need God's lifeboats in their life. And when the storm comes, they're left to fight on their own. May I tell you this morning, God has given each and every one of us as Christians some lifeboats on which we can depend. God's given us some lifeboats to help us when the sea gets tossed. I want to talk to you this morning for just a few moments about this truth. Don't cut the lifeboats. Don't cut the lifeboats. In your life, don't cut the support that God has given you in your life. Don't cut the help and the, and the, and the favor and the, 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 uh, the possibilities, the, the, the ways to get through the trials. Don't cut the lifeboats in your life. Let me say this, number one, don't cut the lifeboat of God's word in your life. Psalm 119, 103, the Bible says this, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. May I tell you, God has given you and I, and we talked about this in Sunday school a little bit, but God's given you and I a very dear lifeboat in the Word of God. I can't tell you how many times with John I had nowhere to go, and I resorted back to my lifeboat that we call the King James Bible. 
May I tell you, God has given you a lifeboat in the Word of God. There's an old statement uh, I've heard from the time I was a child. Maybe you're familiar with it, but it goes like this. It says, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone whose life is not. If your Bible is falling apart from use, probably your life is not falling apart. And on that same note, Brother John, I know a lot of people that are struggling in life, and they're fighting, and they're flailing, and their Bible is pristine. Oh, it's got a little dust on it. (laughs) But those pages are like new. Now, I tell you, God has given us a lifeboat in His Word. Might I encourage you not to cut it out? We talked about reading our Bible, studying our Bible, knowing our Bible. Now, in Sunday school this morning, might I challenge you? That's what God has for us, a lifeboat in His Word. I heard a preacher uh, preaching this last Tuesday. He, he told me the story of uh, he, was living in, he was living in Florida right along the coast. This has been a few years ago now, Brother Stan, and they had a, uh, a hurricane coming their way. It was coming up the... Come, you know, coming up towards the coast, and it looked like it was going to go about two miles or two hours west of them, and uh, that was the 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 track. It was you know that was the, the calculations. That's where it was supposed to hit, and they didn't really have much fear. And then about an hour before landfall, it changed course and started heading straight for his town. He said, I went out back, and he had a little closed-in porch, a little mesh, you know, screened-in porch. And he said, I got a, uh, I think he said he got a twist tie, and he closed that little door so it wouldn't be banging. He said, I had no idea how futile that was. The winds were 100 mile an hour, 180 mile an hour is what they clocked them at. Before it took the, at 180 miles an hour, it took the, uh, the measurement gear, you know, the, the equipment, it took it off the, off the concrete that was ground into at 180 miles an hour. So the wind was at least 180 miles an hour. And he said in Florida, when a hurricane hits like that, they shut everything down. So if, if you want to leave, you can't. You're stuck. And uh, he's, he, he, he laughed about how silly it was. He said he didn't want that door banging around on his screened-in porch, so he, he you know, zip-tied it or twist-tied it, and uh, he went out after the storm, and the porch was gone. <laughs> the whole, the whole screened-in area was gone. And he looked, he said he, he looked out the little, uh, the little crescent window on his front door and he saw a, a truck tire flying through the air like a Frisbee, about 10 foot in the air. He said everything was just going everywhere. And when, when the storm was over, they walked outside, they saw all the wreckage, and there were some whose homes were virtually undamaged because they had prepared for the storm before the storm. He said, before the storm comes is when you're supposed to prepare for the storm. They were locked in their home. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't even stand outside had they opened the door. I mean, cars were rolling. The winds were so bad. And that man said, you know, we prepare for the storms of life before the storm. Now, I tell you, you have a lifeboat in the Word of God, and you can prepare yourself for the storm by spending time in the Word of God. See, preacher, what do you mean? Well, when the heartaches of life come, you're only going to have, if you don't have your Bible with you, you're only going to have what Bible you've put in. If you don't have your physical lifeboat with you, you're only going to have the help of the lifeboat that you have in you. I wonder how much have we, how, how much word have we hid in our heart? Might I encourage you today that we don't throw out the lifeboat of the King James Bible, but that we read it, we study it, we memorize it. You say, preacher, why? Because it's a lifeboat that God has given us. And when the storms of life are raging, it's something that we can go to and it can help keep our head Amen. above right. water. Right. I watch so many people struggle, Brother BB, and they never think to open their Bible. Might I encourage you that we not throw away the lifeboat of our Bible, of God's Word. Let me say this. I might I encourage you that you don't throw away the lifeboat of a godly home. We all know the story of the prodigal son. Left home. The Bible says he wasted his substance in riotous living. He came back empty and hungry. And boy, he was welcomed home, wasn't he? His father welcomed him with open arms, and we know that story. And boy, what a beautiful picture of what God does for us when we get away from God. But may I tell you today, when that when that prodigal son returned home and he was welcomed back into his daddy's arms, he had still 
spent all his living. That prodigal son, he was able to return home, but he still had wasted his living. That's right. He was broke when he came home. Yes, he was home with his daddy and his mama, but he was broke. May I tell you, if if you have a godly home, I, th I think of you, Aiden. I, I think of others that you've been raised in a godly home. Might I encourage you, if God has given you a godly home, that you not cut that lifeboat. That you not cut the lifeboat of a godly home. This prodigal son, he had a home to return to, but he would wasted everything. Might I encourage you, if you have a godly family, not to throw them out. I wish I could tell you how many of my friends were raised of my equal in a Christian school and in a Christian home, and they've thrown out the lifeboat of a godly family. They'll come back empty, broken. You've seen it. If you've been in church any time at all, you've seen it. People that had every opportunity to, to accomplish great things for God, and they cut the lifeboat of that godly home. Might I encourage you that we not do the same I wish I could tell you what a help and trouble my godly family has been to me. Say, preacher, did you always do what you were supposed to? No. Ask my mama. Ask my sister. <laughs> really, ask anyone. <laughs> no, I haven't. But I'm thankful that I never cut that lifeboat. I'm thankful that I always stayed close to my mama. I always stayed close to my godly family. Hey, if you've been given a godly home, may, may I tell you, that's a lifeboat God has given you to help you survive the storms of life. Might I encourage you not to cut the lifeboat of a godly home? Might I encourage you not to cut the lifeboat of God's word? Hey, let me say this. Let me encourage you not to cut the lifeboat of your church. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24, the Bible says this. And let us consider one another. Think about that. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. To provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want you to notice, folks, that their church, the other Christians in their life, is what was provoking them to love more. Their church family there is what was provoking them to do more for God. And I tell you, God has brought us to a church for a reason. Whatever church you call home, that's the place God has for you. God tells us not to forsake the church, right? The assembling of ourselves together. He says don't forsake your church. Why? Because the church is what provokes us to love one another. That's right. Amen. The church is what provokes us to, uh, to, to do more, to do good, to, uh, to, to, to do good works, the Bible says. I want you to notice their church is what was provoking them. Now, I tell you, when we as Christians abandon our church, we are cutting a major lifeboat out of our lives. We've had people cut this church out of their life. I've never met one person, Brother, Brother Max, that cut church out of their life that's happier now. Not one. Why? Because when you cut church out of your life, you're cutting a lifeboat. You're cutting a lifeboat. Man, I tell you, uh, we as Christians need not abandon our church. When we do, we are cutting one of the things that God has given us to help us survive the storms of life. I've heard we, we had times of testimony. And this, is, this, is not a, this is not a pat on the back of the church, but we've had times of testimony during, uh, during our, uh, our uh, anniversary Sunday. We had it at our watch night service. We had a couple at our watch night service. We had many at our anniversary I can't tell you how many people I've heard say we would not have made it through this year without this church. We would not have made it through the, the, these last couple months without these people here. That's not a testament to me. What's that a testament to? God's plan. Church is God's plan. It's a lifeboat for us. What does the Bible say? Iron sharpeneth iron. You and I, let me tell you something, folks. The men in this church, if there's a man here who's going through a hard time, the men in this church... That's God's plan for you to spend time with them and them to help uplift you and them to encourage you to keep your head above water. Right. Ladies who are discouraged, you don't need to get out of church. You need to get into church. Right. I can't tell you how many ladies are out of church. They're discouraged. And they, they say they're too discouraged to go to church. Well, the reason they're discouraged is because they're not at church. They don't hear the preaching. They don't have the fellowship. They don't have that. They don't have that. Uh, that that provoking to love and that provoking to good works. Now I tell you, your church is a lifeboat. I'll tell you what, brother Max. When my father left my mother and 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 us children, I do not know what I would have done if I didn't have godly men in our church step in and help to fill those shoes. Step in and help us to be where we needed to be. What was that? My mother, she understood that 
church was a lifeboat. She needed to have her kids in the lifeboat. Why not encourage you that we not cut that out? When you get discouraged, when you get disgruntled, let's not cut out the lifeboat of church. Let me say this. You and I, we need the wisdom and the strengthening of other godly people. Ladies, you need the help. You need the encouragement of other ladies in this church. Men, you need the, the strengthening. You need the encouragement. That's why things like men's prayer meeting, ladies soul winning, those are things everybody should want to go to. Why? Because you have an opportunity to be provoked to love. The other, how many of you ladies here, you've been, you've been challenged by another lady at church? You've been challenged to do more by another lady at church. Not necessarily this church, but a church you've been to. You've been challenged to do more. Well, I tell you what, I'm challenged all the time by our men. Sometimes they challenge me not to wring their neck. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but, but God's people are supposed to challenge one another. That's what the church is supposed to do. When we cut the lifeboat of church, we're cutting a very important lifeboat that God has placed in our life. Let me say this lastly, and we'll, we'll be finished. Now, don't, don't get ahead of me. This is half my message right here, okay? So, so uh, buckle in, I guess is what I'm saying. Why not encourage you not to cut the lifeboat of prayer? Psalms 116.1, the Bible says this, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. And then called I upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Here we see the psalmist was in dire straits. He says, hell got up around me. I don't know if that was a visit from his in-laws or if he was, you know, just going through a hard time. But we see that this psalmist here, he was in dire straits. And he says he called out to God, and what happened? God helped. God helped. I, I think that I, I, I look at that verse and I, I read it, Brother, Brother John. It says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got, got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. And then the very next verse, I called upon the name of the Lord. The Lord helped him. Oh, bless the Lord. Hey, may I tell you, uh, when, when, when you and I, when we throw out the lifeboat of prayer, we're throwing out the most important lifeboat that we have in our life. May I tell you this morning, God has given you prayer as a lifeboat. God has given you and I prayer as a lifeboat. And by the way, I'm all for seeking godly counsel. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school. I have counselors to, to whom I go. I'm all for seeking godly counsel. But might I encourage you before we, before we seek godly counsel that we go to the lifeboat that we have called prayer? Do you understand, Brother, Brother Jeff, for me to go seek counsel, I have to first forego prayer. Unless I pray before I seek counsel, if I put counsel above my prayer, I'm making that more important than my prayer. Now, I'm all for seeking counsel. I think you ought to. In fact, I think more people rather stand should seek counsel. Typically, the average Christian, rather than seeking counsel to do what's right, they go do what's wrong and then seek counsel on how to fix what's wrong. We get ourselves into our own messes, you know. I'm all for seeking counsel, but might I encourage you that we not forego the lifeboat we have called prayer. God has for us to pray daily. God has for us to pray often. Continually, the Bible says, may I tell you, when you can't get counsel, when you can't talk to anyone, you can talk to God about it. And that's God's plan. He's given us His Word. We can hear from Him. And He's given us prayer so He can hear from us. I wonder, when's the last time you had a heartache? And maybe it was a sensitive subject. You couldn't talk to your spouse about it. And you had no one to go to but the Lord. I'll tell you what, Brother Stan. When I was in college... I was working 70 hours a week, 22 credits of college, a semester, had a wife and a child, ran a bus route. I was going all, I mean, uh, I, I didn't sleep, I don't think, through the weekend. I had someone come to me critical of me and, and virtually attack my character. 
and my wife heard about it. And boy, I tell you, I don't know if your wives are this way, you, you ladies are this way, but I mean, I've never seen Michelle so mad. I mean, forget all the Christian, you know, uh, being considerate. She was ready to gouge this guy's eyes out. I mean, she was just, just hot about the matter, you know. Now, Brother Jeff, I had to calm Michelle down, and I had to deal with the heartache of someone who I thought was a friend being critical of our service, being critical of my character. Now, I'll be real honest with you. It took a little bit of forgiving on my part because it was someone I had to work with every week, multiple times a week. It was someone who was in authority. It took a little, it took a little praying to get right with God and get right with that fella. But I couldn't take my problem to Michelle because she was, she was already struggling with it herself. I had to help her out with it. I couldn't talk to anyone else about it. That's called gossip. I don't know else I could go to but to the Lord. May I tell you, I'm thankful that I had the lifeboat of prayer that I could go to and get my spirit right when I needed to. And, and whether it's bitterness that you're struggling with, maybe it's forgiveness that you need. Maybe, maybe maybe you're struggling with your faith. Maybe, maybe you're struggling being faithful to something. Whatever the problem is, why not encourage you not to cut the lifeboat of prayer? You know the thing I see about the lifeboat of prayer, Brother Beebe, that is, that is unique to prayer, is you need nothing else to get to that lifeboat. To get to church, there's some effort. To get to your Bible, you've got to have it handy. You need a phone to get in touch with a godly family. No matter where you are, you and I have access to this lifeboat called prayer. I wonder when's the last time you reached out in prayer for help in your trial? Might I encourage you that we not cut the lifeboats God has for us? You say, well, preacher, I can do it on my own. And they did. By the way, they made it on their own by the grace of God. They made it without the lifeboats because God held them up. But boy, I would imagine <clears throat> anyone cast into that cold, wavy water, being beaten against the rocks, finally making it to shore. I imagine if you had said, would you have preferred a lifeboat? I imagine probably everyone would say yes. Why? We might be able to do it on our own, but why would we? Why on earth would you want to struggle on your own when God's given you the lifeboat of prayer? God's given you the lifeboat of his word. God's given you the lifeboat of his church. Why don't I encourage you not to cut out the lifeboats God's given you and I? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. May I tell you this morning, you may be able to survive without the lifeboats in life. But you will struggle all the way to shore.